Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur Show. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host. That's B I W Z A W R O. For anyone who's out there, you can find us on Instagram at Just the Food Entrepreneurs. And if you want to find us or listen to us, you can find your, our on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. So, thank you, everyone, for listening in today. I've, we're back, back in Nashville. Obviously, a special place in my heart. Spent a lot of time there recently. And uh, I have Michael Spencer with us from Nash Dogs out of Nashville, Tennessee. As I said, how are you doing today, Michael? I'm good, Justin. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I love it. So, well, hot dogs, number one. We know that they're they're taking over Nashville, right? They're taking over the downtown scene. Anyone who's been there recently knows there's lots of hot dogs. It's probably one of the only late night options out there right now. So, Let's talk about you, Michael. What's your story? How'd you become an entrepreneur? And uh, take as long as you want, but get us all the way to uh, Nashville and Nash Dogs, if you will. All right. So I'm going to kind of start um, kind of, you know, before the entrepreneurial journeys, you know, began, um, kind of take you into like what built the mindset. And then I'll get to give you a short uh, synopsis of um, you know, how Nash Dogs came to be. Um, so born and raised uh, in Nashville, um, actually in East Nashville. Um, and anyone that's familiar with the area knows that, you know, like 20 years ago, that particular part of town wasn't necessarily uh, as hip as it is now. Um, it, you know, it was very like low income. You know, we lived in the, what most people call the projects. Um, you know, we lived in a place called James Casey and um, I was, so I was born in 91 my father was murdered in 95, right before my fourth birthday. Um, and for a long time, you know, it was just, uh, you know, me, my mom, my sister. Um, my mom was going through a lot. So um, I ended up going to, uh, I stayed with one side of the family and, you know, my sister stayed with the other side of the family. And um, so for, you know, a long time, I just, I saw my family struggle. Um, you know, we really, um I don't know if suffered is the right word, but we, you know, we had a lack of money and, you know, when you don't have money, you can't really get the resources that you need, you know? So, um, I just always remember feeling like super loved and cared about, but, you know, as far as like the, the things that, you know, I felt like, I don't know, kind of make like a, a happy home where it's necessarily there in a monetary sense, you know? So, um, I always just kind of like wanted more. I'm not really like, money motivated but i can definitely see and and i've witnessed you know how um people struggle and you know just lack the ability to really make uh you know big strides in their life without the the right means you know and in this case you know it it was money so long story you know short on that end i um just always knew that i kind of wanted to do something a little more substantial i mean at a very young age I just remember feeling driven, um, you know, driven, um, you know, to, to want to be able to lift my family up and, um, you know, my, so my nickname and my, my family is Papa, the P A P A. This is a nickname that my, my dad gave me. And now as a 31 year old man, I look back and, um, I think it was very fitting because for a long time, um, even at a young age, I was responsible for, taking care of my siblings. I mentioned my sister earlier. Um, after my father passed, my mom, um, you know, ended up finding someone else and um, brought another kid into the world. And, um, you know, that's my my brother. So anyways, you know, they went through their stuff as a couple. And um, unfortunately, it affected us as children. And um, again, just, you know, just tasting a lot of um, what it means to not be successful. And, um I felt super loved, but, uh, you know, just I, I've looked at them as kind of the example of what not to do. If you want to be successful, you know, I'm not going to harp on their situation. People go through their stuff, but um, it just wasn't a great um, it, it wasn't super conducive to, a, you know, a great childhood. So um, the, the goal has always been to put myself in a position to take care of my family in a way that makes the most sense for me, Um, you know, not having to, um, to acquiesce and like, you know, 
like go do stuff that I don't particularly enjoy. Um, but just coming from kind of that, um, I guess, poor background, you know, there wasn't a ton of resources. So I've always kind of taken uh, the path of just learn as much as possible so you can do as much as you can for yourself. So um, I always felt like a worker. And the first time that, you know, um, I had an opportunity to really um, become an entrepreneur and kind of start on my own was, you know, I was like nine years old. And, um, I found a lawnmower in the trash, you know, and like, I don't even remember how it got fixed up, but I thought I would push it door to door and like, you know, charge $10 a yard to, to cut grass. And then, you know, that was when I was like nine. And then by the time I was a teenager, um, I was always like bigger than everyone else. So I, I appeared to be older. Um, so I went into a local mall that we have here. It's called Opry Mills. Um, and back back then they had this um this kiosk inside um called super shammy um some people know it as an asking on tv product called sham wow um you could probably find it on youtube but anyways it was a strictly commissioned job at a kiosk in the middle of the mall um i was like 13 turning 14 and um i was like babysitting my brother at the mall one day we were like hanging out for the day and i went by this kiosk and like saw what they were doing and um a lot about my age and asked for a job you know um he asked me how old I was I thought I was 17 he hired me so um they're just like big spiel associated with it I had to memorize these like paragraphs to be able to you know do this pitch this demonstration and so working on strictly commission at you know a pretty young age like really gave me the the taste and the flavor that like putting those resources that I need in my pocket really kind of falls on me. And, um, it, it, you know, it made it very, um, very black and white, if that makes sense. You know, if you do this, this happens, right. Or you can do this and be in this situation. So, um, that was my, a, a real substantial like flavor of what it means to be an entrepreneur, but I wasn't really ready to, like get into that field. So I worked for people, you know, for a while, just kind of lining my tool belt, learning as much as I can, uh, as, you know, and um, the goal was always to be able to um, learn to do the things to, to take care of myself. So I didn't have to depend on other people to do them for me uh, or, you know, pay someone to do it. So I worked really hard for a couple of years and I ended up working um, in a big box store, uh, in retail and I worked myself up, you know, from a, like a low level, um, customer service associate, uh, to, uh, to assist a store manager and really had my eyes set on becoming, um, a store manager of this, um, of, of this place. And just a couple of years in, I've really started feeling that I, I didn't necessarily need them to accomplish the goals you know, that I was after, I was making close to six figures, but just knowing like the type of person that I am and, you know, not to sound like arrogant, but, you know, I feel like that I have a lot of value that I can bring to the table. Um, so I just realized that and I felt capped, you know, with what they were paying me and the, you know, the way that they were respecting my time. I mean, they're, they're a corporate entity. Their goal is to generate revenue. I completely understand that. Um, so that's what they're going to do. But that doesn't, you know, it didn't align with what my priorities are. Um, my priorities being my family, my personal time, and then my monetary success last. Uh, got a really big belief that if you take care of the first two and do what you say that you're going to, that's the third. It won't fall into place, but, you know, it, it's a lot easier to achieve monetary success when you take care of your family and yourself, you know, get those Agreed. things take. So I agree with that. Um, so, you know, I, I really just I defined my priorities and I, I realized that no matter how much effort I put in to this other person's business, um, I was never going to be fully in alignment with the things that drive me. Um, and I'm not one to acquiesce. Um, you know, I don't want to reluctantly do something for someone, you know, I, I want to do stuff wholeheartedly because I feel it in my soul, not because you're like, Hey, you know, do all of this. And we're going to put $1,200 in your check at the end of the week, you know, and 
for that for that sacrifice, you know, how much time did I miss with my family? Like how many baseball games did I miss, you know, that my son was playing at? Um, and I got to a point where I was feeling like the people that were in that atmosphere were. I spent more time with them than the people that I'm working to take care of, you know, your, your work family, if you will. And um, to be honest with you, they were all super cool people. I'm still keeping contact with some of them, but um, I prefer my wife and my son to just about anybody, you know? Um, so once I realized that I would never be able to really control my destiny fully in someone else's business, um, I decided that the only way to do that was to create my own business, to sit on my own board of executives, you know? Um, because even the CEO of a big box brand still has to listen to the board, you know? And, um, just honestly looking at the situation, I knew how much work it would take to get to something like that. And it's not really something that I wanted to do. So, um, I had been in the food industry for, um, a short time as a teenager, my wife's, um, mother, um, I've been with my wife since I was 16, she was 15. So, um, I worked at her mom's restaurant. She had a really popular restaurant in Nashville. Um, back in the day, it was on the food network and like won multiple awards. She's retired now, but anyways, um, it gave me, um, kind of the, it, it, it helped me understand like that the food industry would be, would be viable. You know, you provide a quality product, you know, at, uh, at a fair price and provide a wonderful experience and people are genuinely extremely thankful for it, uh, thankful for it, you know? So, you know, the, the motto has always, since I've started been kind of, you know, take care of people, fill them up and don't break their pockets, be extremely grateful and they'll come back and see you. So the place that I was working at before I started on my journey, they asked me to hire a food truck, um, to come out to do this, um, customer appreciation event so i called around and i got some quotes and i ended up calling this hot dog guy um the name of the food truck i think it was like dog days and um he probably doesn't even know this but you know he motivated me to to build what is now nash dogs you know so he quoted me two thousand dollars for 200 people for three hours of his time and i'm definitely a numbers guy so I ran the numbers and, and so I ran the numbers with the, the, the most expensive product that you could purchase. Like, you know, we sell at Nash dogs, the hundred percent Angus beef hot dogs. All of our vegetables are, you know, fresh topped, you know, bell peppers, onions, tomatoes. Like we don't cut corners, you know, we use real bacon. So I ran the profit margins and I saw that even with investing you know, a little more money than what most hot dog guys do that I could still turn a really nice profit. And the place that I was working at, um, with the help of a couple of people around me, you know, we made twelve and a half million dollars for our um, pro sales, like contractor department that year. Um, and we were like twelve and a half percent over the last year. And I just kind of took back and took stock, look, sat back and took stock of everything and kind of realized that if I can do this for them with their product. What could I do for me with my product? Because I know the type of person that I am, you know, I'm straightforward, honest, and try to be like really hardworking and I try to do everything above bar. Um, so I started educating myself on how to build a hot dog stand because they were way too expensive to, to purchase. So um, just to kind of sum everything up, I saved paycheck to paycheck over um, the course of a couple of months. And I started building um, the hot dog stand that is now Nash Dogs. Um, December of 2019, I decided that I was going to leave that company. And my goal was to be fully operational and permitted by March 2020. So I don't know if March of 2020 rings a bell, but that is the month that COVID shut down the globe. So I left a six-figure job 
well, close to six figure job to pursue a business. And then three months later, the whole world decided to go in their house. So now I was kind of like stuck, just kind of like holding the ball. Like, what do I do? So from March of 2020 to like November-ish, I just worked as a handyman around Nashville with like hang TVs or paint walls or like whatever I could do to bring income in. And then the whole time I had this hot dog stand sitting in the garage. One day my wife said, so are you like going to use that or are you just going to let it sit there? So um, I started looking, you know, I, I got hungry and um, I found a park that allowed me to set up and that was our first event. And I went out that day and I made $500 and it was my first time out, you know, in my business. And I almost doubled the income that I would have made in a day at the, you know, when I was employed. So that kind of was like all the proof concept that I needed. So, um, I worked to, to find a regular spot and, you know, I got, I was getting turned down a lot trying to find a spot to put our hot dog stand in. Um, I wanted a regular location to kind of pop up and build a community. So I live in old Hickory, Tennessee, which is like, it's a suburb of Nashville. Um, it's been between like Hermitage and Madison. Um, for those that are familiar with Nashville, um, really supportive community. And um, we have this old um, Swifty gas station that turned into a, uh, like a goodwill donation center. So um, people used it as a dump site and would like dump mattresses and couches and trash and just all of this stuff there. Donation center wasn't there anymore, but it didn't stop people from dropping off all their junk. So I would drive by it every day and it was always an annoyance and kind of an eyesore. And I just remember one day I looked over and I like complained about it, like out loud to myself. And, you know, I responded. I was like, well, if you don't like it, why don't you do something about it? You know, instead of complaining about it. And I was like, I will do something about it. And it, it was, that was kind of like the light bulb moment. So I called the owner of the property. I got, um, and I offered him my sweat equity for a spot to set up. So once a week, I would clean that spot, take all of the trash and to, to the dump. And then I would have a spot to set up until the next person dumped. You know, and when the next person dumped, then I had to clean it up before I could put the hot dog stand there again. So did that for, you know, maybe um, five, six months. And um all the while getting great support from the, the old Hickory community. Um, I, I really feel like that when people see you like put the work in and see that you actually care um, about something other than pulling cash out of their pocket, um, it, I feel like it attracts people, you know, to you. you know? So That's I did a service, you know, I, I did a, a service to the community and um, because of that, they have showed me like mad love and have really like rallied behind me. And um, I've got a really great community behind me. Um, and as much as I love Old Hickory, my goal when I started um, was to create something substantial for the, the Spencer legacy. You know, there's not to knock anyone in my bloodline, but I feel like that for you know, however long leading up to me, the goal has been to survive. My goal is to thrive. Um, not just for myself, but for everyone around me, family and friends and people that, you know, want to join in. And so I could have, you know, just hung out in old Hickory and like made enough money to, you know, uh, get me and, you know, my immediate family by, but the passion was to build something substantial. And back then I always said that I wanted to build a national brand and I'm, I'm still kind of like in that mindset. I'm three years in now. So I'm kind of like revisiting exactly what I want to do. Um, but then the goal was to build a national brand. So, you know, we started doing like apartment complexes and like corporate catering and schools and churches and um, I'm booked out like 90 days now you know and my calendar is full for the hot dog stand um and it helps me really start to like be able to put some finances away 
and to really start to build popularity, not just in the old Hickory community, but all around um, Nashville and even into satellite, um, like satellite cities like Murfreesboro and Clarksville and different places. And the demand was just so high. Like people are always calling like, hey, are you in Franklin today? You know, we want a hot dog. No, I'm in Hermitage. You know, so I was missing a lot of sales. So um, about a year in, we decided to open up a spot in Opry Mills Mall. Everything kind of came full circle because that's where my entrepreneur entrepreneur journey started with a super shammy. So I went from working in the mall to owning in the mall. And um, so now we have the hot dog stand and we've got a location in the biggest mall in um, Tennessee. And so anyways, that's um, that, that's kind of the, the Nash dogs journey, like up to, to June of last year. And in the past year, we've even become more successful. We won a, an award for uh, new business of the year. Um, we were featured on News Channel 5, Taste of the Town the other day, and just uh, got our third food truck that we're going to be setting up in Old Hickory as a permanent location. Um, so that's kind of what's what's brought me, you know, full circle. The goal was originally to be on Broadway, but I don't really like being around drunk people. So we figured out a different path and <laughs> found the niche in the hot dog market and um, – you know, there are so many hot dog stands down on Broadway and Nash Dogs has never been down there one time, even though I'm permitted to be on Broadway because I built the stand um, to meet those qualifications. Yeah. Old, old Hickory quickly, like, built me up and showed me that you don't need to go sit on the side of the road and Broadway like you can do corporate catering and all of this other stuff. So Nash Dogs has really started to kind of become a a Nashville brand that people know about. And it's definitely right in the middle of the journey that I envisioned, you know, in December of 2019. So I hope that I didn't go too long on that, but that's kind of, that's kind of the full, the full story front to front to current. Okay. So let's go back for a second. Why did you choose hot dogs? Like what, when you started your first cart, why hot dogs? Because the, the individual told you about it, but was it like, I'm going to do hot dogs and, like, how did you go sourcing it? How did you go supplying the truck? Like, talk to me about all our trailer or whatever, the cart. How did you go doing all of this? Like, talk to me a little bit about that. So I'll kind of so I'll start from, um, you know, meeting – or not meeting. I, I never even met the guy. You know, he owned a food truck. It was called Dog Craze. He gave me a quote. We probably had, like, a couple-minute conversation. The event that I was supposed to be booking food trucks for, we didn't even book a food truck for because it was too expensive. I ended up like catering from Chick-fil-A, I think. So anyways, he, um, he just, he said hot dogs. So I kind of like, I just immediately went to hot dogs. And honestly, since I've been selling hot dogs, I've looked around and like at some of the other concepts around me, such as like cheeseburgers, like I could have made Nash burgers or something like, I, I don't know. Like there's so many other different things that I could have done. Um, But for me, um, and I told you earlier that I'm not super like money driven, but I am logic driven and the investment in a hot dog is substantially less than a majority of the things that you can sell. And um, I'm not a professional cook. You know, I'm all, I'm completely self-taught. You know, my mother-in-law is, is a chef. My wife is a chef, but as far as me, like I can cook a good steak, but as far as being like a creative cook, um, I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm in that, that, you know, category. I'm not classically trained or anything like that. So it was just kind of easy for me to do, you know, you're putting meat on a grill and, um, putting some toppings on it. My wife is definitely the, um, the half that elevated Nash dogs. And I really truly believe that if she hadn't influenced my decision-making at the beginning, when I was building the menu that we would not be anywhere near where we are um, t- today. You know, I had other ideas about some of the like toppings and stuff that I wanted to use. You know, I, 
not even really even considering the quality of it. You know, I was just thinking like, like pre-chopped bell peppers and onions. Like it's going to save me some time. Like why not? And she's like, she's like, absolutely not. She was like, we're going to chop fresh onions every morning. We're going to chop fresh bell peppers because like, if you're going to charge somebody um, for, for a product, you're going to give them what they paid for, you know? And I, I definitely agreed with that. So, um, we, we kind of started to come up with the, um, I kind of got ahead of myself there. So before we came up with the concept for the menu, I, I built a whole hot dog stand. Like I made a logo first. So I got that idea from the hot dog guy. I researched a little bit of product, ran some numbers, saw that it was viable. Then I came up with a name and then I came up with the logo. So I had the name and the logo before I ever had anything. Um, I kind of built it in a weird way, you know, maybe backwards a little bit. Uh, and then I found this video on YouTube um, by this guy named Wayne. And he was like building hot dog stands. And I just knew that I didn't have the money to go out and buy a hot dog stand or a food truck. You know, um, a good hot dog stand is like thirty five hundred dollars, um, like on a cheap end. And honestly, it doesn't really do much for me. Like the 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 image that comes to your mind when you think hot dog stand is kind of like that classic like stainless steel cart with an umbrella over the top of it and you got a guy standing side by side with you making your product you know so i wanted to coming from my, my mother-in-law's restaurant cafe bosna um, we were really big on like hospitality and customer service and serving people the right way um so i wanted to serve people over a counter instead of standing next to you you know, like, like, if that makes sense. So I took Wayne's ideas from YouTube and I incorporated them into this vision that I had in my head for, you know, what is Nash Dog now. So Nash Dog is like a hot, the, the trailer is something like something you've never seen. You know, it's, um, it's built off of a four by six utility trailer. Um, you actually climb up in the trailer. It's open, you know. Um, and it's just got like this stainless steel countertop. It's got a grill and a sink. Um, and then as far as like the aesthetic, it's like red cedar fence panels and um, like a galvanized sheet metal. And we took um, old license plates and um, put them on the back to spell out the word Nash Dogs. Um, so everything is just like handmade. You know, um, I was I've always had like a an interest in carpentry. So like. I can build furniture. I like I have a, you know, bookshelf and like a table and stuff that I've put together. And I just kind of, I was like, if I can build a table, I can take Wayne's ideas and make a hot dog stand. So I built the hot dog stand. And so now I've got an idea, a logo and a hot dog stand, no way to sell hot dogs. Um, so we, we started building the menu up and then we started, you know, we got out and, um, started kind of seeing what the, the the feasibility of the business was I had a very small menu back then it was just like a couple of like really basic hot dogs um the original which is the nash which is um duke's mayo heinz mustard and a fresh cloth and pickle spear um that was like our our signature dog you know um I fully intend on one day turning that turning that into the official hot dog of Nashville just like how Chicago has a Chicago dog I love it all right. So um, we went out the first day with mayonnaise, mustard and a pickle on a hot dog. And uh, honestly, like a couple of like frozen toppings. This is before um, we started doing like the fresh veggies and everything. And my wife really started to influence the brand. And, you know, she was like pretty straightforward. She was like, if we're putting our name on this, she's like, we're going to, you know, elevate our product. We're going to start doing like the fresh veggies and everything. And Coming from a customer service world in retail um, and kind of understanding that it's important to like not necessarily sell yourself, but it's really important that like the folks that you're trying to interact with, that you know, you, you want them to be interested in what you have, um, that you, you know, that they like the person that you are because you can have the best product in the world and be an, and be, um, 
you know, not the greatest person yourself. And someone is, may give you, you know, they're probably not going to buy your product, but you can have a, a mediocre product, a great personality and treat people exceptionally well. And they'll come see you just for that. And for me, it just kind of comes natural. I mean, I really believe in altruism and, um, treating people the way that you expect to, to be treated. You know, we're all human beings. So I just wanted to give people an elevated experience and like kind of meet their expectations. Um, and so we started really getting interactive with our customer base. Um, we have 10 signature hot dogs now. Um, and almost every one of them is a customer suggestion that's been market tested. So can you go through process. those 10? I'd love to hear them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I'm going to tell you kind of how we do that, and then I'll go into what those are. So, you, Justin, you come up to Nash Dogs. We're chatting. You're like, man, these hot dogs look awesome. You've got so many different toppings, Michael, but you don't have this. So let me ask you a serious question. What are, what are your favorite toppings on, on anything, not just a hot dog? Oh, uh, well, if it's burgers and hot dogs are like, but bacon for sure, tomato, uh, mayo, you know, those things, even on a burger. I mean, even on a hot dog, uh, cheese. Okay, perfect. So let's go with those. Bacon, tomato, mayo, cheese. Great. I love those ideas, Justin. Now, earlier you told me you have a horse. The last You had a horse. Do you, you have a dog by chance? Yes, I have a dog, Brutus. Brutus. I love that name. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take your concept, your bacon, tomato, cheese, and mayo, we're going to call it the Brutus dog, and we're going to put that on our menu for 30 days, and Brutus is going to, if it's okay with you, we want to use him as a pup rep. What that looks like, just need you to send me one or two pictures of Brutus where he looks super cute or happy, and we're going to put that on our social media, and for 30 days, Brutus is going to be the Nash Dog's pup rep, and he is going to represent you know, the, the Brutus dog, and for that um we, we take pictures of brutus or not brutus of the brutus dog um and it's on social media and then we'd ask you justin to come in you get a free brutus dog bring your wife she'll get one too and then we're going to give brutus the actual dog a chopped up angus beef dog right so now you come in you're like oh man that's so cool that you um you know were interested in what i did and now you know you're like brutus is on Facebook and Instagram and he's getting love and that's super cool. You know, and my mom's going to come up here and check it out too. So now your mom comes up and she's like, Hey Michael, I love your toppings. Like, have you thought about doing these? And I'm like, I haven't, what's your dog's name? Right. So that's how that went. So that's the concept of coming up with the hot dogs. And now we put them into effect. So we have the dapper, which is bacon, cheddar, grilled onion, and Duke's mayo. Um, there's the Herman, which is actually my wife's creation. It's bell pepper, onion, both grilled, crushed original Lay's potato chips, and then Heinz mustard over the dog. Over the dog. Um, there's the Potter, uh, bell pepper, onion, bacon, mayo, and mustard. We got the King Chicago, which is a take on. Um, there's a restaurant in Chicago called Portillo's. Um, Chicagoans are very particular about how a Chicago dog is served. So when we first brought that hot dog on the menu, we had a huge demand for it. People were always asking, but it was a little intimidated because it's got seven different toppings on it. Um, and the people that are asking for it, they expect it in a very particular way. And if it's not in that way, they will let you know very quickly. Um, so we named it the King Dog because we do have some variations. A Chicago dog is supposed to be boiled. We grill ours to perfection. A Chicago dog is supposed to have neon green relish. We use sweet relish. And then instead of using a poppy seed bun, we just sprinkle poppy seeds over the top. It's a beautiful hot dog. Um, but even with the what they call the Chicago 7 on there, you'll still have Chicago and come up and say, that is not a Chicago dog. So we call it the king. Again, you know, taking care of the, the customer, just being grateful that they're interested in even, you know, trying Nash dogs. Like, we'll change the name of the hot dog if it makes you happy. So you got Dapper, Potter, Herman, King. We talked about the Nash already. That's mayonnaise, mustard, and a pickle. 
there's the Don, which is a New York classic. It's mustard and grilled sauerkraut. Um, what am I forgetting? There's the Bentley. Um, it's mustard, coleslaw, and onion. And there's a couple of other ones on there. But the, the big thing behind our menu is we really like to be able to provide regional favorites locally, right? Um, I was actually out yesterday and I talked to a gentleman and he was so excited about the Chicago dog because you can't get it. You know, he's like, you can't get a good Chicago dog anywhere in Nashville. Um, you do. You just got to know where to look. Um, so that, um, that that's kind of the, the concept behind the, the hot dogs, you know, and then the other two that I didn't mention are, are, classic chili cheese grilled onion we call that the bear that one's actually named after my dog um and then we have the hamilton uh, which is bacon chili cheese ketchup and mayo and that one is pretty pretty top notch so that's kind of the the story behind the the dogs and the menu and kind of the concept of how we came up with them so you have one food trailer you get started. How do you grow this business into three trailers? And then let's talk about getting into a brick and mortar versus being a trailer in a little bit. But let's like, how do you get to three? How do you build to one to get to multiple? How do you build a staff? How do you build a team? How do you build a set of employees? Talk to me all of that. How do you go from one to three basically? And do you build all of them the same way you built the first one? So that first hot dog stand, um, you know, the goal was like, just to get something going, um, I had an idea of success, you know, and I am really big on delivering on the things that I tell myself I'm going to do. You know, we all have a child inside of us that um, is looking to be like satisfied and given the things that it wants. Um, so I felt like I had a responsibility to deliver on the promises that I told myself of like time freedom and being able to align myself with my priorities. So hot dog stand number one, um, other than the initial obstacle to finding a spot to sit up, uh, set up, um, I won't say easy, but it was, and maybe not even ever. I don't. I can't really find a particular word, but I, I will say this: like I, I was extremely motivated, but I didn't really need any more gas in the tank. I, I mean, I had a fire under me, and there, and still now, there's nothing that's gonna stop me. Like I told myself, I'm gonna do it, and I know for one thing for sure is like if I say it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen because, um, I don't know. I, I, I say I'm going to execute, you execute, right? So that's how hot dog stand number one came. An attitude of gratitude, being extremely grateful for the people who choose to come eat at Nash Dogs every day. There's more restaurants than any of us can count, not just in Nashville, but the whole world, you know? And for someone to take their time to decide to come eat a hot dog, and not just any hot dog, it's not a $2 gas station hot dog. We charge 6 to $8 for our product. It's a, It's a premium hot dog and therefore you pay a premium price for it and you know we say it sometimes nash dogs aren't for everybody if you're looking for a roller dog from mapco you might want to slide to mapco and that's okay i respect that but if you want um a quality product and you want to feel appreciated and taken care of and you want us to you know and you want a great meal come by so you know for the first uh year or so we really grew off of word of mouth and um, can't stress it enough. The people in Old Hickory, particularly Old Hickory Village, um, they they rallied behind us and they treated us like family, and they brought us into the community and really just uh, kind of took us under the the wing of the community, if you will, you know, and made sure to to lift us up and put us in a spot for success. You know, um, I feel like that the the sweat equity that I put in to begin with um, really kind of spoke volumes and literally, I mean, my wife would get off. I mean, she has a master's degree, you know, my wife would get off of her salary job and come sell hot dogs on the side of the road. You know um, I'd have my son out there like throwing football between orders. And I just feel like that the, the vision, the goal, I, I've always been 
very willing to articulate it for people and let folks know um, the, the reason for the passion behind what I'm doing. I'm not cooking hot dogs because I like cooking hot dogs, I'm cooking hot dogs because I'm trying to build a generational legacy of like a wealth of knowledge and like income and resources. And I've always been very vocal about that and willing to tell anyone, you know, that wants to listen, like this is the journey that I'm on and this is why. So hot dog stand number one was, um, it, 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 it kind of just, it happened. I, I look back and like, we would come home and like look at our sales reports and just be like, holy crap. Like, did we really like make X in a day? Like for sure. So it started to get to a point to where we were saying no to a lot more business than we were saying yes to because of our capacity. You know, again, my wife salaried, works full-time job. We also have a nine-year-old who's very big in the sports. He's a three-sport athlete, so baseball, football, um, and basketball. And um, there, I left that job that I left to have time freedom and the ability to be with my family. So missing out on opportunities and sales didn't really make a lot of sense, you know, because like back then I uh, had a lot of opportunities and a lot of work to do, but there was only one person doing it. And every once in a while, my wife would pop up and, you know, that's cool. I could have kept doing that up until now, but just being like as driven as I am, um, just seeing those opportunities come. And honestly, just to be frank, coming from a poor mindset, you know, coming from like the projects, like, like where sometimes like we didn't have food. I mean, if you're like, Hey brother, like you want to come out and make $600 today? Like I'm like, I'm already there. Like for sure. Like I'm on the way. So when I'm weekly, like not even weekly, like daily telling people, Hey, thank you for the invite, but we're committed to another event and we're booked out 30, you know, 30, 60 days. Please consider us for your next event. Like eventually you start counting those no's. And the nose like add up to like a lot of um, opportunity cost, you know, um, that's missed. So all the while that's happening, I'm paying for every food truck needs a commissary. A commissary is a place where you take your food truck to service it. Um, you store your dry goods. You put your cold goods in the refrigerator. Do do prep. You know, you empty your water tanks and fill your water tanks for your hand sinks. So I had a, um, a restaurant that I was paying a couple hundred dollars a month to use their space and really had to work around their schedule and, you know, just make sure that the Nash dogs business was not operating in a way that was going to conflict with what they had going on. Because if you don't have a commissary, you're kind of dead in the water in the health department's eyes, you know, and um, really big on doing stuff above bar. Um, if no other reason than just to alleviate my anxiety of someone saying, Hey, you're not doing that right. So the commissary was a big hurdle and I was just looking at how much money I was spending on it. And um, I have ambitions outside of food trucking. You know, I have, other concepts that I want to apply that I've learned since I've gotten to the food truck industry. Um, and, and one of those is to be able to provide a commissary for other food trucks, um, which now I do. So we opened up an Opry Mills. Um, I, I was walking through the mall one day and there was another hot dog stand that had closed inside the mall and I never try to be critical of what any other um, food place is doing. Um, like publicly, you know, obviously I have my opinions, but I saw this other guy and he just, um, he wasn't taking advantage of the opportunity that he had, you know, and, and just to be frank, the thought was like, sir, like, are you seriously like letting that, what you have like fall to the wayside, you know, like it, he's running this hot dog stand in the mall, but he lives in Florida and he's got a staff who's like pissed. All, I'm sorry, upset all the time. Um, so 
and they're not they're not making any money so they went out of business and um as soon as they went out of business i was like that's mine so i got in touch with the mall i already had um a relationship with the the manager of the with the the mall manager um just based off of my work history when i was like 13 14 so after 10 years you know i went in the office and she remembered who i was and i was like hey what's up with that hot dog stand up there i'm trying to have that you know so started researching and um we, we had, it wasn't really conducive it wasn't a location that could support the style of hot dogs that we cook um they had a roller grill very similar to um like what you see in a gas station you know just drop the hot dogs on there and they roll to their hot um we grill our 100 percent angus beef to perfection which creates um steam and um grease laden vapors as the the fire marshal likes to call them which requires a hood so our location inside of the mall is a kiosk and there's nowhere to install a hood um you know a hood has to be vented through the ceiling typically um so that was not an option so um I wouldn't, I really didn't want to be deterred. It was a great location. And the one holdup was we've got to figure out how to vent grease. So got online, started doing some research and I came across this company called Equipex um, and they sell, um, they sell portable hoods. So I saved my, saved some money up, bought that hood. And uh, that is what allows us to be in the mall. Um, you know, it, gets rid of the grease so now we're we're in there and it was just me and my sister when i first started working in the mall and um we finally had our own commissary it was finally not paying out um you know a couple hundred dollars a month to another business just to exist um and so now i had the mall and i also had the hot dog stand whose business now was kind of waning because I'm only one human with two hands and two feet and I can't cut myself in half, you know? So I solely focused on running the mall until it was able to run itself. So for maybe four or five months, I worked really hard to, to build up a staff um, and get them into place. And luckily had some family friends um, that, that I knew that were able to join me and, um, that family friend brought in the person that is now, um, you know, my, like my manager, you know, and the, one of the other people that I have in there that helps me manage is someone that I knew from, um, old Hickory village. Um, there's a farmer's market. It's called the old Hickory village farmer's market. And that was one of our first locations that we started setting up on a regular basis. Um, they do it every Tuesday from like summer to fall and it's from four to seven and we would go set up and I'm telling you, Justin, we would set up, man, and we would have a line like never ending for three and a half hours to the point where like when I was done cooking, like I would be having like back spasms and I would have to just like sit down and like have a glass of water because for three hours solid, you're just like cooking as many hot dogs as you can because old Hickory village is like excited that Nash dogs has popped up, you know? So anyways, I kind of um, got off on a tangent there. So Sarah, um, she, amazing person. She joined my team and, um, really gave me, um, kind of that, that, that stability and an employee that I needed. Um, and then I had some other people that kind of did the same thing. And, um, I'm, I'm really big on, you know, treating people how you expect to be treated. You know, I, I said earlier to have, you know, like a, an attitude of, of gratitude, you know, and, um, just really kind of understanding like what I disliked about working for people and then being able to do um, something different in my own business to, to show people like, you know, um, we, we have defined goals as a team and as a company. Um, I've, I've really tried to work to help them understand like the magnitude of the opportunity that we have you know, to, to create something substantial for our families. You know, I, I talk about what our vision is because I believe that if people are 
emotionally connected to their company and their coworkers. Um, they'll produce more and rarely leave, you know? Um, so I, um, I just work to instill a culture of not like hard work, but hard work so that we can achieve that the time freedom and the independence that not just Michael Spencer is looking for, but that we're all looking for from the, the highest manager in the company to you know, the person like washing dishes, like every one of them is important to me. And I understand that no one is coming to Nash dogs because they like cooking hot dogs. No one's coming to Nash dogs because um, they like need to like, they have a need to like come like get out of the house or something like people are coming to work because they have to work. They have to have an income in order to support like their families, their lifestyles. So that's how I treat it. Like I treat it as if like you're coming here and you're doing me a favor by being a part of my company. So I'm grateful for that. And I appreciate you being here and I'm very transparent. Like from the start, what is it that you're looking for an employer? And what is it that I'm going to need to do to, to align with that so that I can, you know, um, determine whether or not we're a good fit for each other? Because like, if you join Nash Dogs, like, again, we're here for a paycheck, but this business isn't just about making paychecks. Like, I'm trying to build something, a, a generational legacy for all of us, you know, and, and I need help. So that is how I kind of was able to start building a nice staff, you know, is just showing the gratitude and being con considerate and um, really speaking on kind of what it is that, um, that, that I expect and trying to treat them like they're, they're human beings. And I firmly believe you either appreciate your employees or Nash dogs will. And I say that to people all the time and they always look at me like I'm crazy, but you have, appreciate your employees or Nash dogs will. And I think that that's the biggest issue like in the corporate world right now is there's not enough altruism. Like people don't consider each other. It's all about how we, you know, like increase the bottom line and people get treated like a number, you know, and someone told me when I work for, you know, the, the, the last person that I did, like, like you literally have a sales number. It was one nine seven Oh one one four. And I still have it memorized, you know, and like anytime I did anything, what's your sales number? Like literally it's just a number on a piece of paper, you know, and the the CEO isn't looking at those numbers, like, you know, lining them up to names, doesn't care. I care, you know, I've got like nine people that work for me, but I fully intend on one day, no matter how many people it is, I'd like to shake all of their hands and I'd like to know them, you know, I'd like to know like what motivates them to be a part of Nash Dogs and like, like, why are you here? You know, because it, obviously it's, you know, to make some money, but like, why do you need money? I actually had something really satisfying the other day. I had one of my employees tell me that she was able to pay for her daughter's braces with her Nash Dogs check. And that was like one of the coolest things that I've heard, you know. So that is because of that group of people, the, the, the location inside of Opry Mills has been able to thrive. Um, I've poured energy into the people around me in hopes that they will pour energy into the people who choose to come have a Nash dog. So Opry Mills has really um, taken off and kind of solidified itself. And it's about five or six months in, it got to a point to where I was able to kind of slowly take step by step away from that you know so now i pop up there maybe once a week um and that's just to check in i do supply runs still but right now i'm working to have someone else that's doing supply runs um but slowly i've taken responsibilities off my plate for running that location and given it to the people who i trust most and the, the people you know who i think are going to to be around with the goal of getting back to the original trailer. Um, so we got back into that and I was able to fill the schedule right back up. Um, and but the, the thing that Opry Mills did is honestly, 
it kind of disappointed some of the people in Old Hickory. Um, people always thought that my first regular location, I felt like that they expected it to be an Old Hickory just because that's where we started. And that is kind of what I wanted, but at the same time, um, just wasn't really ready to pull the trigger on that. And it wasn't that really a great place um, in the village for me to find a spot. So we put the spot on the mall. And then the next goal became to find a way to have a permanent location in Old Hickory um, because those people will like literally send me messages on Facebook and Instagram and they're very blunt about it. Like, hey, why are you not in Old Hickory? Like, where are you? Like, when are you coming back? Like, it's not like it's, it's not out of rudeness. Like they have an expectation like you've given me the, this delicious hot dog. And now I have to drive all the way across the city for it. Why? You know, so um, my wife and I came up with the, the goal of putting a regular location in Old Hickory. And I have a belief that brick and mortars are almost a thing of the past. You know, they tie you to a location and you are beholden to the traffic that comes through there and um kind of just have to hope and pray for the best because you got a stack of bricks sitting at a particular location that you can't pick up and move so um my strategy is that i'm going to put a trailer a, you know a food trailer in uh, on the side of the road or in old hickory village and i'm going to build that location up and i already know that it's going to do well but i want to see how viable it is being open seven days a week you know nine ten hours a day so we saved our money up and we just recently in the past. So in February, we purchased um, our trailer and um, just finished getting it wrapped and uh, I got it permitted. And there's a couple other little things that I need to do to tweak it and get it um, actually operational and ready to go. But we're going to put it in old, old Hickory and uh, it's going to sit there seven days a week. And I'm hoping that, in six months to a year, I can look at some sales reports and figure out if the numbers actually support maybe having my own stack of bricks, you know, in, in a regular location. Um, and I don't think that, you know, this particular community, Old Hickory, will ever need or will ever require me to, to go somewhere else. But eventually I'm going to put trailers in other areas as well. And, you know, the, the whole concept is to test those areas with the food trailer. And then if it makes sense, we'll put something more substantial there. If not, we'll move the trailer to somewhere else, you know? So that kind of brings us current on how all three things happened. Yeah. And you mentioned being different than every other hot dog stand or every other food business. Like, and if people aren't happy, they'll be happy with you. Talk to me about the core values or the things that make your business that make Nash dogs different than other food businesses and other hot dog businesses. I mean, just talk to us about that. Walk us through, because I think it's an important business exercise here. Um, so I, you know, to, I think to be a leader and an entrepreneur, um, have, have a really clear vision of what it is that we're after and kind of the direction that we want to take things. I talked earlier about sharing the vision with the, with my team and kind of, you know, giving them the information that they need to understand. We're not just chasing dollars. We're like chasing independence and time freedom and the ability to take care of our family in the way that makes the most sense for us. And so I think that we're, let me rephrase. I know that we're different because although I'm a capitalist, I'm an altruistic capitalist. And just to define that word, altruism is the selfless concern for the well-being of others. So, um, and, and just to be transparent, like I'm not 100% selfless. Like I do have like um, self-serving things that I that I do, but for the most part, I think that it's extremely important to consider how what we do and how we act consider the people around us, or uh, not consider affect the people around us. So just to say that one more time, I think it's extremely important to consider the, how the things that we do 
affect the people around us, you know? Um, so I, I, I like to be reliable. I feel like our business, the three things that make us different are reliability. You know, we are trying to execute a plan um, and not just any plan, but the plan to be um, independent and have our time freedom and do things um, the way that we see best. You know, like I'm the leader of the company, but I'm like fully open to my people around me. And like, I want to hear what they have to say. Um, so that I can make it a business, not just for me and the Spencers, but for all of the other folks who choose to invest their time into the business, you know, because I could have run the Nash Dogs trailer by myself for the rest of my life. But if I want to create this national brand, I have to have people on board, you know, so reliability saying and doing the things that you know we're actually that we actually say that we're going to to do um which kind of leads into uh the next point which is trustworthiness you know it's a really big deal to to execute on your word um i feel like that most corporate entities they say stuff just to generate a dollar without actually standing behind that value and it's it's pretty um it's pretty it's a pretty crooked way to do business to be honest with you like that 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 hook and bait thing like where they show you one thing and then completely change it just to pull some dollars out of your pocket is the most manipulative thing that that you could do to someone and it's what disgusts me about capitalism i'm i'm a like literally have a tattoo on my chest that says made with pride um in the United States, I'm like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm American. Like I love the United States. Like I'm big about the red, white, and blue, you know, but at the same time, like people have to be respected and cared for and valued. And, um, dollars are, I don't know they're, they're almost like blinders. And I think that a majority of the people, the capitalists in our country feel like, well, as long as I have money, I can, you know, do whatever the hell I want. You know, it doesn't matter if I step on people, what are you going to say about it? You know, what are you going to do? I've got all of this money when really like what matters is like, what's in your heart, you know, and, um, and how you're, how you're treating people. Um, I, I kind of spoke on it earlier. Like you can trick people into giving you money one time, but they're not going to give it to you twice. You know, you can trick someone and to come in to get an $8 hot dog one time, but if they show up and it's not grilled to perfection and you don't make it with love, they won't be back. You know, um, you might get a couple of people who, you know, are okay with mediocrity and come see you again. But if you want people to come see you all the time and to support what it is that you're after, you need to be reliable and trustworthy, you know, um, execute on your plan and execute on your word. Like this is what you should expect. And I'm going to deliver that because I told you, and I, and I know that I'm going to deliver on it because I have an altruistic nature and I care about your well being, And I'm, I'm concerned for your happiness. I don't want you to leave Nash dogs and be upset. Like he said this, but he did that. That's, that's not how people should roll. And I think that it's almost comical that people, feel that they can take advantage of people and then sweep it under the rug with some, with some cash, like keep that cash. I don't want it. You know, we have a saying that we, that we use up at Nash dogs and I've only had to say it a couple of times, but every once in a while, somebody, a customer will come up and they catch an attitude with like an employee, you know, employees like being super friendly and taking care of, but they're just like being rude. I don't want your money. And I'll tell people that. Like, I'm a very kind person, but if I hear you say something out of the way to one of my employees, you can put your money back in your pocket and go somewhere else because Nash Dogs isn't for everyone and we don't accept rude money. So altruistic capitalism, the, the concern for the well-being of others. In that particular example, it's my employees. I feel like that if I were an employee and I saw the owner of my company tell someone I do not want your rude money. Go somewhere else. I would, I would, I would need to work for that person, you know? So reliability, 
trustworthiness, and I've been talking about it the whole time, altruism. Those are the three values that I feel like that makes Nash Dogs, that I know that makes Nash Dogs different than almost everywhere else, because we considered altruistic capitalism from day one. And, you know, the concern was, you know, definitely to build something for ourselves and to make a way to have time freedom and resources that aren't finite. Um, but altruistic capitalism has been in place since day one. And I think it's a shame that a majority of the, the corporate entities in the United States focus on it second as a marketing tool. And it's, it, it really, it like bothers me. And I try to almost go out of my way not to do business with, um, people who I feel like pander for, for business, you know, either you stand on your values or you don't, you don't say one thing. And then six months later, it's different because you're trying to appease a different demographic of people. Um, I feel like that the message that I'm putting forth altruistic capitalism, it is umbrella to take care of all of the communities that may want to come participate in what we've got going over at Nash dogs. And I think that once that, the rest of our country really decides to start caring about what is happening to the consumer who's choosing to shop with their business, we would be in a better place because you can go anywhere. A lot of the times people just go to places out of the convenience that, uh, that it provides. But this new generation of children that's coming up right now. I feel like that they have a different set of values and morals that's put in place because as a uh, as a species, we're like so far advanced, you know, and we have so much access to resources and technology and information. It's hard to just walk around and be closed minded and ignorant. It's hard to miss the fact that you're supposed to be taking care of people. And I feel like that now for the one of the first times and I may be incorrect. I mean, I'm 31. Like, but I feel like that now that these children are finally starting to get a little bit of a flavor of what it means to put people before yourself. And I'm super excited to see the next couple of generations to see how the um, direction of our country starts to go from business all the way up to politics, because I know that there's other people that have some of these similar thoughts that I do that have come up in the nineties and the two thousands to watch this corporate greed, like absolutely ravish our land. And I think that it, in the next couple of years, people my age are going to start really getting the politics and being able to affect stuff. And I'm very excited to kind of see where everything goes. Sorry about the tangent. I know that was a lot more than you asked for. No, we're cool, dude. I love it. Um, let me ask this because I'm definitely going to have you. I'm going to reach out to you after I get off of here at some point today. I'm going to send you dates because we're going to definitely record a part two because I want to dive deeper into some of these topics if that's cool with you. But yeah, before sure. we get off of this one, because I had to choose between which questions I want to ask you last, because, again, I want to have you on a part two. But let's ask this. Who were your role models growing up and why? Because to get to where you are, what did you look up to? You grew up in Nashville. What You know, Nashville now is not what it was even in the 90s. But let's, you know, talk about who were your role models, who did you look up to, you know, and why? So – at the risk of sounding a touch morbid, I won't say that I necessarily had the traditional role model. I had people in my life who showed me, not intentionally showed me, but people that I observed for, you know, like the first few years of my life, I'd say up until I was like, you know, 12, 13 years old, like until my brain actually started to work and I could like question stuff. Um, I didn't really have a role model. I, I more or less had people showing me examples of the things not to do if you want to be successful. You know, for an example, like we were homeless for a while and we slept in our car. Why? Because my mom's boyfriend was a drug dealer and he sold all of our stuff in our house until we didn't have a house anymore. And then we couldn't pay rent and our light and water got lights and waters got turned off, you know? So I always knew, hey, man, if you want to be homeless and sleep in your car and not have electricity or water, go sell drugs, like go do a bunch of drugs. And then you also will get to have the privilege of being homeless and sleeping in your car. So 
um, that was kind of the initial motivation, the initial mentorship that I had was more um, the slap in the face that life is, you know, and understanding that to, to make a way, you've got to do something different. So, you know, I just kind of told myself at a very early age, they're doing this, so I'm going to do that. You know, they're doing A, so I'm going to do B because A gets you here and I don't want to be anywhere near there. I want to be literally on the other side. So maybe it's not even B, it's Z, you know. So that was the initial thing. Um, I started working at Super Shammies in the mall. I had a great group of guys around me. Um, and, you know, they were all like strictly commissioned salesmen. They were in their like mid-20s, late 30s. Um, and they just kind of took me under their wing. You know, they were um, – when you get a couple of minutes, go to YouTube and look up um, Sham Wow, S H A. S H A M W O W. Um, you know who Billy Mays is, the OxyClean guy, or um, the ShamWow guy. His name was Vince Sales. So those guys, I originally thought that I wanted to be an ass seen on TV, like spokesperson. So my first, like, really big influence was Billy Mays. Um, he was a ass seen on TV salesperson, and um, he just had a great like energy about himself. And the way that he sold, like we've all seen OxyClean commercials. So you can replace OxyClean with Super Chamois. And that's what I did. And so the guys around me, you know, they did that too. But they were grown men mentoring a 13-year-old, 14-year-old uh, kid. So that really affected me a lot. Um, as far as like, you know, outside of them, like real, real like, mentors and like they're not mentors but like real entrepreneurs that are out in the in the world um there's dr farrah gray um he's from chicago he also um comes from a very poor and like humble background at six years old um in the chicago projects he um started making bottles of lotion and i think it was like I think it's candy and he would go, no, no, it wasn't candy. It was rocks. He would find these cool rocks outside and he would polish them up and clean them. And then he would go door to door as a six year old with a little lunch tote. And he would like sell lotions and the lotion was just like lotion he got from his mom, you know, and like squirted into a small travel size bottle. Anyways. So he has a book. It's called Realionaire, the nine steps to um, becoming a, a real millionaire. You know, um, and I read that book um, when I was like 13, 14. So Dr. Farrah Gray and that book, Realionaire, really kind of um, like a six year old, you know, can be an entrepreneur. Like, why can't I? I didn't know what I wanted to do yet. Years later, still on my entrepreneurial journey, um, you know, working for the employer that I mentioned earlier, um, I got into this company um, and I'm pretty sure it's a uh, and like MLM like multi-level marketing um, it was called world financial group and um, there is this guy that runs it and he's actually really popular now his name is Ed Milet and um, he is a tremendous guy um, I didn't understand the value of the way that he articulates what he says, you know? So I'm in world financial group and Ed is, um, a big producer for world financial group. Um, when he started his journey, world financial group does uh, life insurance sales. Um, so that's what I was trying to do. Like I, I thought I was going to get into life insurance and I got my license and all of that. And we would go to these seminars and they would MLM us, you know, and like tell us all the stuff. And Ed was always someone that they would, um, he would show us his videos and we read his book. And Ed is one of the, the biggest partners of world financial group. And, um, I just really got behind his message because I've realized that it was, although he was, promoting a product what he was actually telling you was how to be an independent entrepreneur on your way to success with or without world financial group and because of that altruistic nature it really attracted to me so 
Um, if you don't know who Ed is, you should definitely, um, he's got a podcast. You should definitely look into him, but, um, I, I've kind of to sum that up. Um, I, I really feel like that Ed has motivated me a lot, Ed Milet, because he's able to kind of build a vision with this audience and like show you a path, enlighten you and explain how to execute based off of the, the simple task that are or in your life, just things as simple as like your mindset and the things that you tell yourself, you know, and um, so just to kind of sum that up, the people in my life, um, the, the people at Super Shammy, Billy Mays, Fair Gray, Ed Milet, that's the, 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 the influence. Yeah, uh, for me as well, um, I would say on the Ed Milet side, obviously I'm in Arite, so him and Andy Fursella are obviously big mentors of mine um, uh, and other individuals in that group. But I agree with you on the books as well. I've had a lot of Russell Simmons, one of his books called um, Get Rich, I believe, or Super Rich, it's called. That was a big influence on me. And, um you know, Tony Hawk's book, um, Unlikely CEO, talking about him rising to a CEO when he's a skateboarder, like a goofy skateboarder. And, um, you know, things like that. I think there's a lot of different ways of mentoring ourselves and finding um, those core values out there when they aren't being demonstrated at home, for sure. Um Michael, if you want, if you had to say anything to anyone out there listening in before we got off, uh, who's on their journey, uh, maybe similar to you, what would it be? Um, so I say this wholeheartedly act and serve from abundance and know that everything is already taken care of. That's it. Very cool. Where can they find you online, Michael? Where can they find you personally? Like, if they want to reach out to you, if they're in Nashville, they want to do an event, how do they get to you guys? The easiest way to find us is NashDogs.com. Um, you can also find us through our um, social media, at NashDogs. And our regular location is inside of Opry Mills Mall um, through Entrance 3. And our food trailer travels all around the city. You can find the upcoming locations on our website. Very cool. Thank you guys. And anyone listening out there, thank you guys for listening in. We're going to have um, Michael back definitely for a part two. Going to hear more about Nash Dogs because I've got other questions here for him. I, I'm sure the audience does as well. So if you guys have questions for him and you hear this episode, send them to me. Also, um, thank you guys. You can also find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. And thank you. The downloads are going up. I love you guys, and uh, you can find us on Instagram also at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs, and we're out.